Hi and welcome to Neat AI. So I was wondering this week about the way in which different factors can affect the performance and output from a standard neural net and how best to visualize this. This would include things like the weight initialization range, the number of hidden layers, the number of nodes in each layer, fully connected versus semi-connected networks, the different types of activation functions that you could use, should you normalize the data you feed into the network, does it make sense to center it, and the impact of the activation function being used on the output layer nodes. It was about this time that I came across an article on the Towards Data Science website. Now I hear good and bad things about this website. It provides a platform for people to exchange ideas and expand their understanding of the data science topic, with articles ranging from basic data science skills to metadata extraction, forecasting algorithms, and self-supervised learning. And there's a deep dive section with articles about data warehouse fundamentals through to creative applications of deep learning. So on occasion, I'll browse through it and recently found an article which used a very visual output to provide immediate feedback on the impact of changing a network's parameters. It's called Making Deep Neural Networks Paint to Understand How They Work. And it involves passing the pixel coordinates as the input to what he calls a compositional pattern producing network and having an output of color for that pixel coordinate in the form of an RGB value taken from the three output nodes. The starting point is a simple fully connected network with four hidden layers, each containing five nodes, and starts by looking at the impact of different ranges for connection weights when the network is initialized. It goes on to explore the activation functions being used at both the hidden layer as well as the output nodes, the impact of normalizing the input values to a value between 0 and 1, and what happens when you start to add more nodes and hidden layers to the network. So let's start with the network itself. It's a basic feed-forward fully connected network with four hidden layers. There is no evolution, genetic algorithms or back propagation going on. It's simply a single network which takes the input coordinates and outputs a color for the pixel in question, which then gets plotted on screen. The activation function used at the hidden layer nodes takes the input value, applies them to the function shown and outputs a value between minus one and plus one. At the output layer, the nodes use an activation function which outputs a value between zero and one. This is then multiplied by 255 to give the corresponding RGB value for that pixel. So for a 200 by 200 pixel image, each pixel coordinate is passed into the network and the returned pixel color is plotted on screen. But instead of getting the expected image shown in the article, we get the dreaded grey goo. The author of the article also got this blank output on his first attempt, and the reason is the very narrow range of random connection weights allowed during the network initialization. In this case, it was limited to plus or minus 0.25, so very tight, and he goes on to explain that this resulted in the average signal tending towards 0.5 at the output nodes for every pixel, which when you work it out, it's this dull gray color. So the first thing to do is to allow the connection weights some room to breathe and let them select a value randomly between plus or minus 100. And when we did that, we got the following. Each image being shown is the result of the network being reinitialized with random connection weights. They're all 200 by 200 pixels in size, starting at coordinate 11 in the top left and extending down to coordinates 200, 200 in the bottom right. Getting the weight range right is an issue I also had when starting out with coding up the neat solution for exclusive OR. It simply wouldn't work, or it took far too long to converge on a solution. I eventually tracked the issue down to the weight initialization range, which was far too tight. And once I opened it up to plus or minus 20, it worked straight away. So the output from the network is big streaks of these bright primary colors. Now I would expect to see something more nuanced and subtle, especially given we have inputs ranging from 1 to 200. The reason we don't is really quite simple, and it's all down to our activation function. This will output a value between minus 1 and 1, depending on the input value. But you can see from the graph that any input above 2 will result in the output of plus 1. Now nearly all of our inputs to that first hidden layer will be greater than 2, resulting in an output of 1 from the nodes we should then get summed together and propagate through the network to the output. The reason we don't just get one single block of color at the output is due to the random weights and the connections leading to it, which generally scale some of the inputs back within a range which gives us a few streaks of color. What we need to do is to scale the input layer values into a range suitable for the activation function chosen for the hidden layer nodes. So let's start by putting them into a range between 0 and 1. This is achieved by simply dividing the pixel coordinate by the image width for the x input and by the image height for the y input. My image is square, so they are both the same. It results in the following. So we're starting to see a lot more granularity in the image signal. This is due to the inputs now largely falling within the range of the activation function, which allows for the detail to be teased out in more cases. We don't have any negative inputs at this stage, so we're only using half the activation function, but it's definitely a better result than before. Now, I don't think I bothered to normalize the inputs when I did the Asteroids Neural Net Pilot. It would probably have worked quicker if I had. Without this step, the mutations have to adjust the weights to a greater degree to compensate.
but we're still not making the most of the range available in the activation function. Thus, it would be nice to center the inputs around the midpoint. So let's tackle that next. The adjustment we need to make to the inputs for this step really is quite simple. I just need to subtract 0.5 from it prior to applying it to the network. Once you do that, you get the following. So now we're seeing images which have an input range of plus or minus 0.5. The area of interest is now centered around the 0, 0 point, which moves it to the middle of the image. And as we have a negative component to the input values, we're making better use of that activation function. So what would happen if I up the resolution to a 500 by 500 pixel image? Well, we just start to see more detail. And upping it again to a 1000 by 1000 pixel image gives us the following. Very nice, but there's still a lot of detail hidden in the center of that image that I want to extract. Sure, I could just copy and paste it into some software and just zoom right into the middle, but it's going to get all pixelated and not be of much use. To zoom in on the center, all I need to do is to scale the input. I do this by multiplying it by the zoom factor that I want, so multiplying it by 0.8 will result in it zooming in by 20%. Let's just see how much detail can be extracted. Here's a couple of other examples. And of course, we're going to want to explore the effect of adding nodes and more hidden layers can have on the output. Generally, the network with double the layers is more pixelated than the one with double the neurons per layer. The pixels indicate that in those areas, the function changes sharply, and hence there is more structure to be found if we zoom in further. While for the network with the original number of layers, but double the neurons per layer, the function is pretty smooth and hence less zoomable. And let's not forget that it is a neural net. Although I'm not going to change the topology or activation functions at this stage, it's an easy thing to mutate the connection weights randomly to visualize the impact different mutation rates could have on a network. In this example, I've taken the network and given it a 1% chance of a connection being mutated by plus or minus 10%. So that's it for now. As always, thanks for watching.